This video will help guide you through how to conduct a one-way within Subjects ANOVA using SPSS. So in order to do that, let's first start with a hypothesis test or a research question that can be answered using this type of analysis. So the hypothesis um, that we are going to test or the question that we're gonna test is a researcher is testing the efficacy of a GRE prep course. So in order to see if the course is actually effective, she has the students complete the practice GRE before the course. So this is the baseline measurement. Then halfway through the course, she has them complete the GRE again. And then she also has the students take the GRE one last time at the end of the class. So the students are taking the exam at three different times before the class, in the middle of the prep class and then after the prep class. So we wanna know if this class actually led to a change in the GRE scores. And we're asked to use an alpha level of 0.05 to test this question. So some things you should notice about the actual question itself is first off, we have the same group of students that are completing this practice GRE at three different time points. So it's the same students that are completing the GRE at the baseline and at the midpoint and also at the end. So that is a within subjects design or it's also known as a repeated measures design. So that's one thing that we would focus on to know what type of analysis we would need to conduct. The other thing that's important to note is um, that there are three different time points that are measured. So since there are three different time points, the appropriate analysis to use would be an ANOVA or a repeated measures ANOVA or within subjects ANOVA. So we can't conduct a t-test because a t-test is limited to only comparing two different time points or two different conditions to each other. So since we have three different time points that are being measured, and it's all measured within the same group of participants. And our DV is numbers, it's GRE scores. And uh, there's just one factor here. So the factor being uh, what time point they're taking this test. So all those things are what help us understand that the type of analysis we will do is a one way repeated or within subjects ANOVA. So let's go ahead and uh, do this in SPSS. So here are my data in SPSS that reflect the measurements of GRE scores for all of the students at these three different time points. So just a thing to note in SPSS, remember that each row represents a person. So since this is a within subjects design, we have for each person a measurement at the baseline, a measurement at the midpoint, and also a measurement at the end. So the way we're gonna go about analyzing our data is just like most other analyses, we're gonna start here at the Analyze drop-down menu. From there, we're gonna to go to this option that says General Linear Model. So make sure you're choosing the right one because the one right below it looks very similar. But the one we're gonna need here is this Repeated Measures option under General Linear Model. So when we click on that, it has us uh, come up with a within subject factor name. So that is um, basically just whatever your independent or quasi-independent variable is, whatever your factor is in your study, just come up with a name for it. So really you can name it anything you want. You could keep the factor one if you want, but I think it's more important to, you know, name it something that's reflective of what that factor actually is. So the factor involved in this study is the time point in which the GRE was being measured. So that time point or the number of times that the GRE was measured in the study was three. It was the baseline, the midpoint, and the end. So the number of levels are three because we had three different time points. So after you name your factor and then add your levels, go ahead and click add. And from there, we'll click Define. So 
when you're here, essentially all you need to do is move your different levels over into this box here where it has these question marks. Since there is an order to these different levels in this study, I'm just going to maintain that same order, whereas the time point one was the baseline, time point two is the midpoint, and then time point three is the end. It doesn't really matter what order you have your levels in, uh, just as long as you really make sure you are aware of what order they're in. And there's also going to be some information on the output that reminds you of what order you put these in. But if there's a meaningful order, I would maintain that here. Then what I want you to do is go ahead and click on this Options button. In that Options section, go ahead and select all the things that are right here. So all of those that are right there, highlight them, and then move them over into this Display Means for box. And also check this box right here that says Compare Main Effects. And then down here you can ask for any of these uh, statistics that you want, or any of these tests that you want. It's not really going to affect your analyses in any kind of way, it just gives you more information. So whatever you want from this um, output options, you can go ahead and select it. The ones that I definitely would recommend checking are at least this descriptive statistics ones, one at, which will give you the means um, for your different time points, and also the measures of effect size. From here, click Continue, and then from there, we'll just go ahead and click OK. So here is our output from SPSS. So a lot of times SPSS gives us more output than we need, so that is definitely going to be the case here for this analysis. So first, the thing I want to point out is right here, this first box, it tells you what order your different levels or your different conditions are in. So from here on out, the baseline measurement is going to be coded as time one, the midpoint is going to be coded as time two, and the endpoint is going to be coded as time three. So that's really important once we get to the post hoc tests, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So I usually use that, um, that table. This one is also quite helpful because it gives you the descriptive statistics or the means for each of your different time points, which we're also going to look at later on when we're doing the post hoc tests. I usually just ignore this one, multivariate tests. Um, the main one I actually focus on here is going to be that test of within subjects effects. So do make sure you're using, you're looking at the right table because this table, it looks very similar and has a very similar name to the one below it. So we want the within subjects effects table is going to be the primary one we'll use. And then one other table that we're going to use is going to be the pairwise comparisons down here. So I'm going to actually copy and paste these tables into a PowerPoint so I can highlight things uh, and look at them in more detail. So the first table that we're going to focus on in the output is going to be this table that I pointed out, the tests of within subjects effects. So this is going to be the primary table that we're going to use to test our overall ANOVA. So the overall ANOVA identifies whether any of the means are significantly different from the rest. So the overall ANOVA is tested in this table. And there actually are a bunch of different types of repeated or within subjects tests that you can use. So really, you could use any of these lines. The most common one is just going to be this top line, the sphericity assumed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use, and really it's whichever one you want, but I'm going to use the sphericity assumed option. and we're going to look in the SIG column. So we can always interpret the analysis in a pretty much the same way by looking at the SIG column. So in general, with any analysis, anytime that SIG column, which is just your p-value, so remember your SIG column is your p-value. 
So anytime your p-value is less than whatever your alpha level is, which is normally a default of 0.05, but whatever your alpha level is, if your sig is less than that, that means you should make the decision to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that there is a significant difference. The other possibility would be having a sig or p-value that's bigger than or equal to your alpha level. In that case, we would make that decision to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means that there is not a significant difference. So looking at our sig value here, we see that it's clearly less than any alpha level we could ever use. So that sig or p-value of 0 0.00 is less than an alpha level of 0 0.05. So that would lead us to make this decision to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that there is a significant difference. So, so far what we want to conclude, so when writing up our APA style conclusion, usually one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to say what type of analysis we conducted. So in this case, we conducted a one-way within subjects ANOVA. So remember that one way, it just rep refers to how many factors you were studying. So we just had one factor, that factor of time. We were looking to see how that affected GRE scores. And the within subjects refers to the fact of how this research design worked. So it's within subjects because it was the same people across all those different time point measurements. And so that type of analysis indicated that at least one of the time points was significantly different. So since we had three different time points, all the ANOVA identifies the overall ANOVA. It identifies that at least one of those is different. We have to do an additional step in order to see which mean or if all of the means are different. So that will be in the post hoc test. But before we get to that part, I want to talk about how we're going to write our statistics at the end of this sentence that we um, used to make that decision. So we're going to get all of the statistics we need from this table here, the test of within subjects effects. So we use the F statistic in this analysis in ANOVA. Um, and so anytime we're reporting our F statistic, we always write, you know, F in italics, and then in parentheses next to it are two different degrees of freedom. So the first degrees of freedom here, I got from that same row where we um, looked at our sig value. This is going to be your first degrees of freedom is two. And then your second degrees of freedom is going to be in that error section. So 58 in this example. And then you report what the F value actually was. So here it is, there's our F value, it's 193.45. So APA style requires us to round to just have two numbers after a decimal point. So that's why I rounded it there. Then after that, we wanna say what our P value was. So remember that sig is P. Um, however, this says that our P or our probability is zero, which we never wanna say. So even though it's really, really unlikely, our probability is not zero. It is possible to obtain this result just by chance alone. It's just really, really unlikely. So the way we would report a p-value this small is actually by just saying p is less than whatever the smallest possible alpha level we would ever take, which is 0 0.001. So ideally with APA style, we would report our actual value for p, but in this case, it's so small that we don't know what it is even. So we would report this sig value as p is less than 0 0.001. And finally, the last part of this sentence will report our measure of effect size. So since we did find a significant effect, we're going to report that measure of effect size, which is in that same row again, and it's the partial eta squared. If that's not showing up in your output, it's because you forgot to check the option to give you the measure of effect size. So that is an option you have to ask for, so you need to make sure when you're running your analysis to select that option. So in this next video, I'm going to go over how to do the post hoc tests.